And let's head back to the last book of the Bible, Revelation. We begin in chapter 2, the first seven verses to the church in Ephesus. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people and that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Beloved congregation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in many ways, the book of Revelation mirrors some of the themes, but also the structure and the form of Deuteronomy, where the beginning of Deuteronomy, we have a historical prologue where God tells the nation through Moses who he is and what he had done, how he had got them out of the land of Egypt and brought them to the promised land. And Revelation starts in that same way. So we began the year looking at who God is, the great I am, the Alpha and the Omega, the one who's got the whole world in his hands, and then we come to know him and his power and his glory in Jesus Christ, Lord of Lord and King of Kings, that we may leave here today and walk out of here saying, no Caesar, no king, but Jesus Christ. We are not waiting for a kingdom to come. We're not Judaism, nor are we premillennialism, but we know from Revelation chapter 1 that Jesus is the king of glory now. He is the king of the world, and he's ruling all things for the sake of his church. And yes, the church is in the world. Not to be of the world, struggling in this world in the days of the writing of the letter to the Ephesians of Revelation, a tribulation, a great tribulation, where John is on the island of Patmos, and we're going to see that the Ephesians too knew suffering, were undergoing suffering, and yet with the idea that they are Nike, Nike, victorious, glorious, if they will hear the word of Jesus Christ to them this morning. So these letters come to the seven churches, to the angels of these seven churches. It seems to us that that's not like a heavenly angel. That doesn't seem to make sense. It seems more to make sense that this was one of the overseers, the one who was called to bring the word. He is blessed to bring that word. I am blessed to bring this word this morning. Angel simply means messenger. And to the messenger of Ephesus, this is what the word of the Lord is going to be through his mouth and through his reading. But all of those seven churches would have received all of those seven letters all at the same time. So maybe I should have put up a map of Asia Minor, but if you go through the seven circles, you make a, a horseshoe around Asia Minor, going from the east, north, and then to the west, and then Ephesus is the last harbor town that you would take before you would get to Rome, and that all of these churches, though there are more there, fill out then not only a geographical reality in, in what we call present-day Turkey, but it's also then for us in understanding that all of the things that are being commended and criticized in those churches, we need to hear as well. So remember that we saw Jesus with those burning eyes. We see the outside, and we have a difficulty even seeing our own church from anything beyond the outside. But now Jesus is going to burn into the heart of a church, into the heart of the Ephesians, and then we need to listen to would he commend us? Would he have these criticisms of us? And then how do we move forward as the Covenant Reformed Church of Toronto to hear the Lord of Lord and King of Kings and hear what the Spirit says to the churches? And so he starts with the church in Ephesus. The city of Ephesus is the biggest city. It is the most grand city that there is. 
it was a harbor town. And then Main Street went straight from the harbor right to the Colosseum and the theater. And as you walked on either side of the road, you'd find your brothels and your pubs and your bars, the public library, the gymnasium, the public baths. For good and for bad, every kind of entertainment was there. It's not that different than Toronto, except that perhaps it's a little more compact. And people from all over the Roman Empire went to Ephesus. It was a trade hub. It was an economic hub. It was a political hub. And then when you add to that, you have one of the seven architectural wonders of the ancient world, the Temple of Diana, and the cult of Diana. You have then the practice of the magic arts, the development of philosophy, the writing of many books, culture, all kinds of things. It was a flourishing and amazing town in which Jesus Christ said, now it's time to plant the church. And so we sent Paul and Silas there to bring the word of the Lord, and, and it hit the town running. And in just a short amount of time, people were falling on their knees and, and declaring that Jesus is our Caesar. Jesus is our King. And over time, probably one or two generations, the church began to flourish and began to have a reputation of, of being a bastion of orthodoxy, of holding on to the truth of the doctrines that are the truth of the word of the Lord. But they were also in decline. We could say that, that the, the candle is flickering and that, that flame is not burning as brightly as it should because the, the flame is derived from the fire of Christ. And he alone has the power to light it or the power to blow it out. And so he calls them then to listen. The Lord calls the church of Ephesus back to her first love. First of all, we'll see his commendation and that will take the, the larger part of the sermon, then his criticism, and then finally his calling that we too may hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So we think of that church then, right? Paul wrote uh, to the Ephesians after he had left and Timothy was doing his work there and he wrote, consequently, you Ephesians are no longer foreigners and aliens. That means you're not considered goyim or non-Jewish, but fellow citizens with God's people as members of God's household build on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets which Jesus Christ himself is a chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives. So there, everybody else would see, look at the cult of Diana. Look how amazing, look how powerful it is. But invisible to most people, but not to God and to Jesus Christ, there is this group of people, Jews, and Gentiles, people from all over the Roman Empire who normally did not get along. And I want to point that out because if the world is always looking for integration, the only time the world has ever seen it is in the church where there's pure and true integration, where we actually respect each other for our skin color, our culture, who we are, our genders. We receive that in the way that God calls us to be so that we can still be who we are, but as Christians, and that's still true in Toronto today. The only really integrated place in Toronto is churches like this. And we hope that that will become more and more the norm as neighborhoods change and as the Lord brings more people here. As we think that a family is coming within a couple of weeks from Pakistan, out of Thailand, to be with us. That's a remarkable thing. And that is the glory of God. That's the power of Jesus Christ at work in the city of Ephesus or in Toronto. And Jesus commends them. He's generous with his compliments. He, he wants to encourage them. He says, I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles and are not, and have found them false. Now, I want to take a little walk with Luke and Paul, with us together. And we're headed on the way to the harbor in Miletus. And Paul is going to head back to Jerusalem. And all the brothers and the sisters are saying, Paul, please don't go to Jerusalem because you're probably going to die there. They're going to put you in prison. They're going to maltreat you. And Paul says, i got to go. Jesus is my king. And I serve him. And so he calls the Ephesian elders to meet him at the harbor of Miletus. And in one last time, they come together. And, and Luke writes that, that they were weeping. They, they threw their hands on his shoulders and, and they prayed together on that dock. I think that must have been pretty amazing eh, for all of those pagans to see these Christians so emotional and then praying together. What, what a witness that was. But why were they? Because they knew they would never see him again, this side of glory. 
And then Paul, like Moses, he, he can't just leave them. He, he has to speak to them. He has a word for them. And he said to them, keep watch over yourselves as the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in and not spare the flock. And even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day. Now you stand up and you warn them night and day. And apparently that's what they did. That's what Jesus said. You did what I asked you to do. Now, if you go a little further, right? He says, can, uh, he says but this you have in your favor, verse 6, you hate the practices of, of the Nicolaitan, uh, Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, who are these Nicolaitans? Irenaeus thinks that it is a man named Nicol who was one of the original seven deacons who apostatized we're not sure if that's really true. Vanderwall and Chilton think, and they're, they're probably right that there is a connection to the name um, of Nike or Nico to Balaam in chapter 2, verse 14. We'll meet Balaam, and that there is the same um, kind of attack on the church through these men from within the church. And what that is, is to marry the pagan practices into the holy people of God. Very simply, it would mean go to church on Sunday and then live whatever way you want to live. If you want to go see the prostitutes, then go do that. If, if you want to drink too much and, and go to the pagan festivals, then go do that. That doesn't matter. It's, it's a matter of what they call adiaphora. It, it, it just doesn't matter. And that these things were coming from within the church. Now, you couple that in Ephesus, you have those people who had all been trained in the dark arts. Remember that when they came to the Lord, they burned all those magic books and they burned all those things? That was a massive sacrifice of money, by the way. They could have said, why don't we just sell it? Why don't we just bring it to the consignment store? We can make a little money, right, and use it for evangelism. We got to wipe this stuff out. These men took a stand. And they said, when this kind of, of wicked thinking came in, no. And when the Judaizers came in and said, no, we're going to go back to legalism over against the Nicolaitans. No, Christ alone, by faith alone, grace alone. And out of that, we will live good and holy lives. And Jesus says, well done. You've persevered. You've been doing the work of the church. You are the church militant on this earth. You are in that great big city standing there. You've given up a lot. You've given up your families. You've given up financial position. You've been booted out of the guilds. You can't get a place in uh, politics anymore. You're not part of the economy. And yet I'm bringing to you people through these harbors, and you're standing firm for the truth. And the king is pleased. And it's a beautiful thing to hear, because it's one of the ways we're going to read when we get to Revelation chapter 12, for instance, where we read that, that one of those beasts works to kind of suck people out of the truth and bring them in to sort of the gray. And when it comes to the truth, there, there are gray areas in life, okay? But in terms of doctrine, in terms of the way of salvation, in terms of the Bible tells me so, it's black or it's white. And if you mix it, you have neither black nor white. And the Ephesians understood that, and the elders understood that. And Jesus said, well done, but, but, you've lost your first love. And before we go there, beloved, let's take a look at us for a minute. I don't know if any of you saw the report that came out on Global TV this week. For the first time since they've been taking data or stats there's less than 70% of Canadians who affiliate with a church. According to that report, according to the United Church of Canada, they're losing a church a week. That here in Toronto, one of the biggest churches had only six people in at Christmas because they went to a, a natural-based um, worship service. And they said, yeah, people don't like that, so they don't come. But even the traditional one had only 50 people in it. Why do you think that is? Why are mainline churches dying in the city. 
and I think we have to call it, it's because they've lost their way. They've lost the truth. It was the United Church of Canada that led the way through church wedding bans to legalize homosexual marriage. It was the church that did that. And we read that it's clergy that are standing for the rights of women in abortion. And we read that, that the church can't make up their mind about gender or, or sexuality. And the Bible does call us to loving intolerance. And the world is calling us to tolerance. And then the church has to figure it out. And the more and more we become like the world, the less the world needs us. We become utterly unimportant. We don't become distinctive. Why would I go to church? I can get it in the world. And this church, historically, has stood for the truth at some pretty great cost, at, at family parties, which now became very tense. I, I'm looking at the minister sitting in the back over there who came back from classes meetings shaken because of the things he heard and saw. You all have stood for the truth, and please keep doing it. Because we need to be necessary. And what I mean by that is we become necessary to the city when we speak the truth. We become necessary to the kingdom of God if we hold on to the great truths of the word of the Lord. There are yeses and there are noes. And we have to be willing to say both because we love the city, because we love one another, because we love our children. It's why we, we still teach our children catechism. To teach them the great truths, it's why Christian education has been such a part of who we are. But even there we're beginning to see inroads being made by false prophets and self-appointed apostles. It's a fight. You can't just take some time off and we get tired of it. And over a certain amount of time when a church becomes scrappy and we get the reputation for becoming scrappy, then you can hear what Jesus is saying, can't you? Have we sometimes lost our first love. Because if you speak the truth without love, you're not speaking the truth, are you? Because the greatest part of the truth is love. Faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. And if, if things now are defending of the truth spring out of that river of love, out of those streams of grace, then good things and proper things and right things will happen. And I think if we look at the way we've handled ourselves in, in the United Reformed Churches or even in this congregation, we could get gruff, we could get frustrated, we could speak from anger or from superiority. How can you not know? How can you be like this? And so we pushed people away in a way that didn't draw them into the marvel and the wonder of the truth. That, that we can become so caught in the box that we forget that the beauty of the box is the love that we can get out of it and flourish because we can go in the confidence of the truth that we love as opposed to right now where it seems like we're insecure about it because we're always defending ourselves and then we just go ah let's just 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 go on and let's not worry too much about this so jesus says well done you elders you've done a good job you, you've you've held to the truth. You've endured many hardships, but you have forsaken the love you had at first. He, he has a criticism too. And Jesus isn't scared to do either. Jesus sees into that church because I think if you and I would come to Ephesus, especially because we're, you know, Orthodox sort of Christians, we'd, wow, this church has got it together. I mean, listen to the preaching. That, 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 that man is sticking up for the truth there. There's something going on here. They're flourishing in a certain way. They're holding up together. They're busy, apparently. They're persevering. But Jesus says, but I see deeper. And my brothers and sisters, you've lost your passion. Now, what is that first love? Some think it's Jesus Christ. You've been converted. There was an excitement. There was a joy in it. And, and then pursuing all the things of rights and wrongs and all of that, you, that became more important to you. I think that part's probably true, that the institution of the church, that the doctrinal nature of the church became more important than the one who redeemed the church. 
than the one who gave his son to die for the church. John wrote, this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Look, if I speak the truth and I don't do it in love to you, I've missed it. Because I haven't shown you Jesus. I haven't shown you the love of God who sacrificed his only son. And that's why I want you to know the truth. That's why we don't want you to die in sin. That's why we want you to understand the beautiful, marvelous way of, why do you think Satan's trying to stop us and to shut us up and, and, and not allow us to speak to some of the most vulnerable people in the city? And then they call it conversion therapy. What does that even mean? And you know, Satan almost knows better than we do how important it is to love people by bringing the truth because of the great love. You talk about sacrifice. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He sacrificed his son. He put his son on the cross. Why? So that you and I could have salvation. So that as 1 Corinthians 13 tells us, at the end of it, we would begin to know how deeply loved we really are. And then Satan can distract us ever so suddenly by, is it evolution or is it creation? Can it be women in office or not? How is the church supposed to run? How is the church order going to function? And all of that's true as far as it goes, but then our, our passion gets moved. And, and you know what normally happens to a church like that? It implodes. Because at some point, the fight from outside becomes the fight from inside, and then the fight from inside is only our survival or our doctrinal truth, and, and we've missed it all because we lost God. Others think the first love is the people of God that you've lost your love for one another, that, that you become the frozen chosen, that you've become people that are academically interesting and very objective in your Christianity, but there's no warmth. Or as one person said, that the steeple of your church has simply become the headstone of a big cemetery. I don't know that we need to make a, a big distinction here. What did we hear this morning? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Those two go together. You can't say, oh, I love God, John says, and not love your neighbor. The minute that we lose the passion for Christ, when we lose the passion for Almighty God, and then normally, and you can see that's what's happening in the city, when I lose that passion, I don't want to be here anymore. I don't need to be here anymore. It's just me and Jesus and away we go and nothing really matters. I don't need to go to church. I don't need to be with the people of God anymore. But when we go, Lord, we love you. We want to worship you. We want to be with those people who do want to worship you. We will do all that we can no matter what. In any situation, if we have to hide, if we have to do it behind barbed wire, if we have to hide in the corner of a concentration camp with six of us quietly praying, we'll do it. Because we love you. And we can't live without you. And we wouldn't even have this without you. And we need to always be aware of that. That passion that drives us to serve this God who gave his son. Faith leads to action. Grace, as we're going to hear this afternoon, leads to grace. This is love. That God loved us. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. See the two go together now? Doctrine and life, or what we used to call orthodoxy and orthopraxis. Right doctrine and right living. When you go to the orthodontist, he makes your teeth right or straight. Orthodoxy. So you need people who not only can think, but can do, and you need people that who not only can do, but can think. And we never meet those people always together. That's why God has all of you together. Serving this living God, burning brightly, so that you join your light to my light, and we all join these lights together, and now we begin to burn. And Jesus says, look, if you don't get this love back, I'm going to blow the candle out. And I have the right to do it. I don't care how right, how darkly pure, how true you are. I don't care if you have the three marks of the true church. 
pure preaching, proper administration of the sacraments, the proper use of the keys of the kingdom, including discipline, but you have not love. You're just a, a noisy gong and, and a clanging cymbal. Love me and love one another. And then you will keep my commands. And then it will stop being such a duty. And it will be, once again, a privilege for you. And did you notice that it's a choice? As we go to his calling, what does Jesus say? He says, consider how far you have fallen. If you do not repent the things you did at first, I will come to you and remove the lampstand. It's a choice now, beloved. Our calling is to repent. So, so again, we need to look at ourselves. Do we burn with a passion for God? Do we burn with a passion for worship? Do we burn with a passion of love for Jesus Christ? All of me. Take all of me, Lord God. Take anything that, that gets in the way of giving all of me to you. All of us to you. And of course we fall short. We don't love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength all the time probably even most of the time. But is that our desire? Is that where we're going to go? Because that's, that's how we'll grow. That's how we'll grow together. That's how we'll remain strong and sure together. Then out of that will flow the desire. Well, if God loves me so much, I guess I would love what he tells me to do and how he tells me to live as far as I can understand it. And that that becomes then the, the characterization of this congregation, not as people who are scrappy or, or who stood for the right, but they know the truth and they speak the truth in love. And I, I want to be there. I want to go there. I want to be part of this. And in many ways, I think our family can say we have experienced that. And I think we've even experienced a growth in that since we've been here. And the Lord has given us together many funerals, hasn't he? Remarkably. Or when we have a Nick Antonelli to love and to take care of, or a John Dillon and the people that need us. Can we do that together? And we need to love one another and to grow in that. But then hopefully this time of growth will now spill out in, down the front steps there and you know, we enter into the, the world of harvest and they will know we are Christians by our love. Let us grow in that. Let us make the choice to do that because I think we all know that. Husbands and wives know that, right? There's certain times in your marriage you're not always crazy in love. But you kind of keep doing what you need to do. But is that really what marriage is supposed to be? <clears throat> For those of you who have watched Fiddler on the Roof, do you love me? Well, I iron your clothes, I make your bed, I make your food every day. Yeah, I know, but do you love me? What are you talking about? But now that's God's asking you. I know you're teaching catechism and you're making the budget and you're coming to church, but do you love me? with everything you got. And as we grow in that and make that choice, listen to what Jesus says. He says then, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who is victorious. I give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God, his calling. His calling is to your glory. There's a nice play on words there, by the way. It's, you can see it in the Greek. But if Nico is the word for conqueror or overcome, right? So if you wear Nike running shoes, it's, it's victorious or conqueror. <clears throat> the one who is the conqueror, Nike, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life. So remember that the Nicolaitans say, you can go to the pagan feast. You can go eat over there. And Jesus is saying, come to my feast. Love me. Give that up. And I am going to give you the right to eat from the tree of life and the paradise of God. So we kind of have this restoration of the Garden of Eden into something greater, more wonderful, more beautiful that we find out about at the end of the book of Revelation. Jesus loves you. Jesus wants you to taste of the sweetness of his glory. The marvel that Adam and Eve, even before the fall into sin, will never know yet that glory until Jesus Christ comes again and you will share in that glory. Do you know the forgiveness of God? Do you know the love of God? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Then hold on to the hope. This fight is worth it. We are going to win. We are going to overcome. And yet, we know that the church in Ephesus, that church is gone. That the candle at some point was blown out. The church as an institution is never an eternal thing. 
But as we identify the strength in us, and we may, and we must, and we identify the weakness in us, and we may, and we must, then let us also look at the end of it. We're always a people of expectation, a people that are driven towards the end. And we're tasting of the end now. I think that's why eschatology, your understanding of the end times is so important. We're not waiting for something that's going to happen. We're living in the something that is happening. Jesus Christ has kept his promise. The gospel has gone into the whole world and it has influenced the whole world. Why do you think the attacks against the church are worldwide now? Because wherever you go, the people of Jesus Christ are there. But we will overcome in him. But we have to keep fighting. We have to put on that armor of God, which we'll read about next week, the Lord willing. And as we put on that armor of Almighty God, may it be that, that we grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we grow in this passion, that we grow in this love. And, and I'll leave you with the words of the hope that's waiting for you. The angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. You think Ephesus had a great street? It's nothing compared to the new Jerusalem. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And there will be no more night. And they will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. You are the prophets. Go out in the world and teach them the truth and hold on to that truth. You are the priests. Give your life in loving service to God and loving service to one another. And you are the kings. You rule with Jesus Christ now and you will rule with him forever and ever. It is so. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we need you now with your spirit to motivate us to greater acts of love, to a deepening love for you and for one another. Help us, Father, to grow, to be strong in you. Help us, Father, to not be shy with the truth. But when we do it, Lord, let us not be cranky or obstinate or scrappy. Lord, we need to fight the good fight of faith, not fight the fight that wins people by our arguments. Let them know we are Christians by our love. Let us know that we hold to the great truths of your word because we love you and you have loved us so much as we sang together that you show your love and your law to no other people but us that we may tell the world. And so, Father in heaven, bless us now. Let the light shine. And Father, if we are in any danger of, of that light flickering or if that light is going to be blown out, let us know that we may once again gain our first love and fight the good fight of faith and hold on to Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life in whose name we pray. Amen.